Welcome to Fantasy Baseball Deck, everybody. This is Austin, and I'm super pumped to share the how-to series where I'm specifically going to teach you, the audience, uh, how I specifically evaluate both batters and pitchers based on their uh, own individual uh, truest value. Today, specifically, we are going to focus on batters um, and uh, different uh, scenarios with batters that you'll be presented through your uh, kind of your draft process and your draft prep, regardless of if you play on ESPN, Yahoo, CBS, doesn't matter, or format, uh, whether it be rotisserie, head-to-head points, whatever. So um, today's goals, I'm going to go uh, basically talk about uh, two, like compare two players with similar pre-draft ranking being in the same spot, uh, but very, very different floors and ceiling expectations. And then I'm also going to compare two players that had the exact same production in 2022, but very different playing styles and figure out, I uh, really determine which one is more sustainable and which one is the right pick uh, in 2023, kind of moving forward. And then also figure out how to identify the uh, statistical outliers, both the good and the bad. So in layman's terms, figure out who is uh, extremely underrated and who is extremely overrated based on their, uh, you know, their ADP, their pre-draft ranking compared to how they finished last year and what they're projected to do this upcoming season. So if you've never been with me at, uh, you know, Fancy Baseball on Deck, let me share a little bit about myself and kind of why I'm different from the other Fancy Baseball analysis podcasts or uh, YouTube channels that you listen to. Uh, I have strictly a teach, don't preach attitude where I'm very uh, little I have very little interest in sharing with you and telling you um, what to think. I'm more interested in uh, teaching you how to think for yourself. You're leaving my videos as a better problem solver so that you can help yourself on your own. I teach these videos uh, through universal concepts that you can take and apply to your uh, fantasy baseball situation, regardless of what format and what website you play on. So as I mentioned earlier, I try to be as transparent as I can so that, again, there's that level of trust between us. I put so much time into this, but like, why would you trust me? Um, I'm here because I love it, specifically uh, fantasy baseball is my number one hobby and if to add on to it i have determined that i've worked long enough in the uh the, my, my professional career to realize that i think i want to do this full time and if youtube grants uh you know grants me the opportunity to do that then i am going to go at it at full steam and really try to uh make a run at this thing so uh, you know motto fantasy baseball on deck is i can't guarantee you that you'll win your fantasy baseball championship but i can guarantee you uh that you will score more points than anyone else in your league and then motto number two is that you know i watch and research baseball uh, in general for approximately 30 to 40 hours per week so that you don't have to. And this is the service that I provide you. Uh, this document that you're about to look at is going to be, it's a free document that you can access and do like, you know, use on your own for your own research. Uh, I have a draft tool that um, a lot of oh, hundreds of people used last year um, that really helped them through their draft. I'm in the process of creating that too. I provide you a ton of information for free as well as tools for free upfront. And all I ask from you is essentially to engage with me. Let me know how I'm doing. Um, let me know if my teaching style is helpful, what was helpful, what was hurtful and everything in between. And the overall to just, um, you know, subscribe and like the videos uh, because it just gets me one step closer to being able to accomplish my dream that is, uh, you know, covering fantasy baseball full time. And, uh, you know, I couldn't imagine a happier Austin uh, than that. So before I get emotional, let's put away, uh, you know, my face over to the side and focus on the content matter at hand. My YouTube channel um, analyzes ESPN fantasy baseball just because specifically um, ESPN has the um, structure uh, and the interface that everyone uses. They're the market share leader, uh, but they don't put any effort into it. It's super um, user friendly with a ton of traffic, but like the upkeep on it is very bad. If you even see right now, there's only 36 days, 35 days left until uh, opening day. And Tristan Croft hasn't updated his uh, his leaderboard in 12 days. So this is kind of like why I choose ESPN specifically to you know make the most of their mistakes. But again, I'm trying to share information and teaching concepts that you can use universally, whether you play on Yahoo, CBS, fan tracks, it doesn't matter. For someone who is new to fantasy baseball or has played their entire life, it doesn't matter. If you get to ESPN or any of these um, you know, 2023 draft, pre-draft rankings, you're going to see this sort of list before um, you would open up a mock draft. It doesn't have any stats next to it. Essentially, it's just going to list off the um, top 300. And then you can be also go to these, uh, you know, different categories that, you know, we'll separate it by position. Um, doesn't really share a ton of information, just sorts of short, sure, we'll tell you a preview of kind of where people are in the draft. Um, if we go over to a different expanded um, uh, site of information within ESPN, uh, these are the full projections. So this is the same draft order um, and it will give you kind of the same, um, you know, the, the full box scores per se, and a little bit of a, again, the 2023 outlook, but this gets confusing pretty quickly of determining like who's valued what, because obviously it's, it makes sense to show you how Itani is number one, 
and will score you know 300 400 plus more points than anyone else because he's an all-star level caliber player at both pitcher and as a designated hitter but right away off the bat number two and number three Juan Soto has been uh, number one or the number two most valuable player in fantasy baseball for a long time uh, for a lot of reasons but if we're going into the 2023 season and you have him ranked as the number two most valuable player uh, why is he supposed to score uh, every bit of 25 26 points less than Jose Ramirez um, in this projection so you can see immediately that like things get pretty cloudy, but we're not really able um, to uh, like compare them in a, in a concise matter to really figure out who's more valuable than the other and really putting projections aside. This just isn't super conducive to someone trying to learn more um, about the player. Fan tracks, the batters score essentially hundreds of points more than the pitchers do. That's a difference. CBS, whether you're playing head to head roto, uh, what I'm about to share and talk about is all, um, you know, it's all the concepts that you can use again for your situation tangibly, no matter where you're playing or what you're playing, who you're playing against the rules, whatever. So um, I'm going to go over to my information here. Uh, link to this specific document and these tabs are in the comments. So please uh, feel free to interact with it. You should be able to uh, get on. You can't edit necessarily. You can't add in like uh, text, but you can absolutely um, adjust the, uh, the the filters as you need. This is my um, in-draft fantasy baseball like tool so essentially as you're going through your um, your fantasy baseball draft this i created last year the hundreds of people in access that keeps you organized um so that you're forecasting ahead of everyone else who's just sort of um biting and feeding at what they see because no one prepares uh, as much as i do for this thing that i obsess over so uh this is <clears throat> going to be available again this year uh every, by popular demand everyone said it was helpful so um this is the first thing i wanted to touch but specifically i'm going to talk about uh the importance and understanding if you're going to watch the show, I'm going to talk about independent variables and, uh, and metrics compared to dependent variables and metrics. Uh, so long story short, because I can really <laughs> dig into this uh, too long, the dependent variables that are not important to focus on um, are the runs and RBIs, essentially, uh, to keep it easy moving forward. Uh, if you listen to any other fantasy baseball podcast or video uh, or video feed, uh, YouTube channel, they're always going to talk about like, oh, this guy's going to score hundred runs. He's going to hit, you know, 75 RBIs. He's going to steal some bases and we'll find a high average. I think he's going to do great. Well, it doesn't tell me anything because essentially if I need to score a run, if I'm on first base, I need someone to hit me from first base all the way around to home to score a bonus run. Therefore, I have no um, control over whether I score a run or not. Uh, therefore, runs are dependent variables. We're not interested in runs. Though they count for points, we can't forecast for them. To score an RBI, you either have to hit, a, if the bases are empty, you have to hit a solo home run. Um, and those don't happen. <laughs> like home runs are hard to hit. Or if you're walking up to the up to the batter's box, you have to have someone in scoring position or some people on base in general uh, to be able to incur an RBI. So we can't ever project or predict when people will be on base and when they won't be. So uh, RBIs are also a dependent variable um, that are not important to us. What is important are the independent variables, independent variables that we want to specifically focus on as it matters to the quality of the player, their individual production. I want you to focus on this middle tab, uh, which are home runs. Home runs, you always need to make sure that you're hitting at least 20 home runs or more uh, to basically have an opportunity to finish um, in the top 10, the top five of your position when you're drafting a player. Um, also, stealing bases is an incredibly individual stat, independent stat, because say if I am a player um, who doesn't have a ton of power, I can still be an, in, uh, an independent player because even if I got a single, if I hit a single, I now I'm first base. If I can independently steal second base, which the steals are going to go up as well as every hitting category because the bases uh, just got this much bigger and every steal that you've ever seen, the person that's safe is only safe by this much. So we just about double the amount of steals that we'll see uh, this upcoming year. So if I'm able to get on, uh, on first base, uh, whether it be a single or a walk or a hit by pitch, whatever, um, not a super uh, awesome stat to be like, stuck on first base because there's a lot of work for me uh, to do now to get all the way to, around the home to earn that, uh, you know, that unforecasted, unexpected uh, bonus score which is going to be the run. But if I'm able to, as an individual, get on first base and then steal second base, I'm putting myself, me stealing second base, I'm putting myself into scoring position. Ignore the fact that it's worth a point. People look at stolen bases and they're like, what does 15 stolen bases throughout the year mean to me? Uh, 15 points, not that much. But if you just think about the concept of if you have a faster player, how many more singles are being stretched into doubles because this player is you know, that much faster than you know the average bear kind of thing? 
How many times is someone getting on to first base and then being able to steal second base and make that meaningful move forward so they can put themselves into scoring position? They're putting themselves into a better op- a better opportunity to score those bonus runs that we can't forecast for, right? So that's really it. Stolen bases <clears throat> are a lot of times are something that you kind of look for or look over or look past. Um, if you're not in a rotisserie league or like a category league, but if you always keep them kind of like in your mind and understand that they're always sort of playing into the big picture, they can really help you um, build the uh, kind of like understanding of who's more sustainably valuable than others when comparing players and making decisions in the draft. Those two, you'll always see in a box score. What you won't see in a box score, and what's most important to this conversation, is going to be total basis. If you do not know what total basis is, total basis is just an overall volume across the season so far. How individually productive have you been as a hitter alone? Not a, not a base runner, just as a hitter alone. So if I'm in the batter's box and I hit a single, I have one point added to my total base. That's the end of it until the next at bat. If I get a double, it's two points, triple, three points, home run four points the most points you can ever add towards your total base score in one at bat is four points again this is sort of measuring how from a volume perspective all season how um you know quality of a player is as a hitter not a base runner next you can imagine total bases per hit per hit i want to figure out how many bases you're covering uh per hit this is always going to be in a double it's going to be between one and four if you had anything close to a four you essentially would be hitting a home run every hit um if you're if that helps you understand better kind of how total bases work um, we are always at going for players uh, that are essentially um, at around that double number. So if you can get a player, regardless of where they're ranked in the draft, if you can get players that are averaging as close to a double or over a double that, that you can, you're always going to be in a way better off. You're always going to be way better off um, than anyone else around you. Now, <clears throat> we will go through a situation where there are the death by a million paper cuts people that are uh, more single machines than anything, but because they're so fast, uh, they they make themselves into uh, more productive same tier players as the ones who are getting uh, that much more quality per at bat than they are. But we'll go over that in a second. And the next is kind of the all-encompassing total bases plus stolen bases. So we are really measuring um, individually how productive is a player at the at the plate once they get a hit, and then also how productive is the player on the base paths so that in all cat in all facets of baseball as an offensive player, how individually productive are they and how um, able and willing are they uh, to put themselves into situations where they can succeed, um, you know, and, and get that bonus help that we're not planning for, but is needed to, you know, score fantasy points. So again, we can't play, we can't plan for runs because we need someone to get a hit to score a run, essentially. We can't plan for RBIs because we can't ever expect there to be people in scoring position uh, when we come up to the plate. All we can do is measure individuals as individuals, and that's through total bases and stolen bases, and always making sure uh, that our home runs are 20-plus for the season, for the most part, depending, like, 20-plus for a full-time player, adjusting it accordingly. That's the, uh, you know, if you have a, a part-time player, someone who's either hurt or really, really young, uh, this home run uh, per 550 at-bats number uh, just gives you an opportunity to Figure out how much how many home runs would this player hit if they were to play a regular season. So 550 at bats um, is essentially someone who is going to play 150 out of 162 games per year. So a full time player, um, regardless of where they're in the lineup, uh, someone who's going to get full time playing time. Uh, you know, how many home runs would they hit across the year? You always want someone who's above 20, unless they are uh, you know that super volume person who is hitting over 600 at bats and it'll inflate. But whatever that number's there for you. But again, want to focus on total bases plus stolen bases that will give you the overall uh, most natural individualized score per batter. So let's focus on three cases. First case, I want to go over our uh, orange men over here, and I'm specifically going to talk about Trey Turner and Jordan Alvarez. They are uh, the rank, uh, on ESPN at least, they're ranked 16th and 18th, right, bunched up next to each other. In this past season, they scored very similar. They're only six points at, uh, apart from one another. But let's dig into the details. Trey Turner is the, uh, you know, Mr. Consistency plays 160 out of 162 games per season. Um, He does everything right. He's never injured for the most part. Knock on wood, knock on wood. And it just seems like he is faster than everyone else in the field. He has a 99 speed, uh, speed rating and Though he is not a super duper power guy, he's always hitting at the top of the lineup and stealing bases and this, that, and the other. So, uh, Mr. Consistency, Trey Turner, he's going to be in the top 10 uh, with points. He's going to be the number one or two shortstop every single year. Just a guy that has a super duper high, probably the highest seal or um, floor per se. Now, let's also go out like at Jordan Alvarez. Jordan Alvarez is your number two pick overall. 
Jordan Alvarez, what, you know, Trey Turner does not possess is the ability to like win an MVP. Uh, Trey Turner, because he is more of a death by a million paper cuts and always doing the right thing and always being available, he's more uh, separating himself as an independent player uh, through volume. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, as you can see in the same number of at-bats, Jordan Alvarez would blow past Trey Turner, but it's expected that Jordan Alvarez being the injury prone MVP candidate, uh, that he's going to miss 20 to 40 games per year, being a 25 year old individual with two knee surgeries on on both knees kind of thing, uh, one per already in his career. But um, if they both played for the entire season, you're, uh, no questions asked, Jordan Alvarez would surpass Trey Turner by a mile. So it's really determining what is valuable to you in this position, um, looking at, again, a potential MVP or a guy that you just know is going to be super dependable, but is not going to be, uh, you know, a, a top 10 or a top, uh, you know, five contributor overall with a second pick that's super duper valuable if you're going to go after a batter uh, at the shortstop position. So, or off or whatever. <clears throat> Let's look at the number of bats again. There's almost 200 at-bats separating Trey Turner and Jordan Alvarez from one another. Um, if we look at the hits, there's 50 hits separating them. Uh, and then we get into kind of the nitty-gritty of things. Uh, there are a ton of singles, difference in singles. And, you know, obviously Trey Turner is not ever going to hit nearly as much home runs, 16 difference than you are Alvarez. The RBIs are similar, even though, again, there's almost 200 less at bat. So we'd expect you are Alvarez to be in the 130s, 140s range for both hit runs and RBIs with how productive he is per at bat. And um, again, the RBI is the same. I said that before, but this is kind of the, the thing that we always kind of keep in focus. We always pay, we need to pair along with our total base and our total base per hit count is understanding what the true value of stolen bases are. Uh, because again, talking about how many uh, doubles per year is <clears throat> Trey Turner able to leg out compared to the average bear because he has a 99th, uh, you know, percentile speed sort of thing. So he has 26 more stolen bases than Jordan Alvarez, um, similar uh, average and, and all these different things. But like, let's look at kind of the um, uh, scale wise, what this means to us. So though, yeah, Trey Turner has more valuable than just, or about volume than just about anybody in baseball is going to hit at the top of the order. Last year, he hit the three spot and still managed to have 652 at bats. So if we go to total bases just for the year, how trade, how, how valuable is Trey Turner volume wise? So as your second pick overall, as it seems like it's, it's, it's pretty consistent. Trey Turner is going to be, he's, he's 11th overall this past year in total basis. So as a batter, um, whether it was a single or a home run, just chop, 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 chop the entire year, he was 11th. Okay. Which is, that was Trey Turner is super duper high floor. This is what you can expect out of Trey Turner, but never expect him to be in the top five and top five players are really, um, you know, what we're kind of going for, but it, Trey Turner fills a role or a niche, however you, depend to go depending on your comfort risk level whatever so if we transition to now we understand that trey turner is you know, again 11th overall um, jordan alvarez was 19th with way less at bats than everybody else um so that doesn't really paint the picture there for uh, a total basis for the whole season but this is how we figure out kind of like what's the value for those players that get hurt throughout the year uh, like the mike trouts of the world and the jordan alvarez's who like if given a full season they clearly would be a top five pick but it, you know if in butts included so top total bases per hit uh what we're focusing on now is going to uh shift it and talk about who is most productive per at bat <clears throat> and it's going to list you know the byron buxtons of the world the william contreras the mike trouts the Aaron judges the current john carlos stantons a lot of these guys are the, the guys who again not like the average isn't above 240 um therefore i would stay away from them on exception for at byron buxton byron buxton's always been a two uh 240 and above hitter uh besides just last year and he had so little bats there and 40 bats um he's kind of like off my exempt list but everybody else in the uh below um the 240 like number their average is so low that they're getting on base so little that you essentially need to um uh, avoid them at all costs because their average isn't high enough to give you enough volume to keep up like because cal uh, cal raleigh or kyle shorber um this past year you know he's he's able to average you know 2.18 uh total bases per hit over a double that is incredible but he also strikes out 200 times and throughout his career he's been like a 180 uh batting average so this is just someone who like besides last year has never been fantasy relevant in my head and has never been a, a top you know top 25 player in even his position because he just doesn't have the volume to be able to compete uh, with the other players around him so we look and see that um jordan overall stats included regardless of how much they played uh jordan alvarez was 12th uh in all of major league baseball quality per hit we've already determined man if jordan can just get another 100 at bats he would surpass trey turner by a mile 
he's a top five player, but he's never, he's just never had that many at bats in the season because he's just, he's, he's never healthy. That's kind of the risk. Again, sort of the Mike Trout situation where like Mike Trout only needs half the year to finish a tie as a top five or a top 15 outfielder uh, because he's so quality per the bats. He's just, you just know he's going to miss a lot of time. So Jordan Alvarez, is it worth it kind of thing? So again, we see that he has the 12th most uh, quality per at bat um, hitter in major league baseball this past year. Well, let's like include Total and, and total basis plus stolen basis. So, and again, like let's go. I we want to go scroll all the way down to talk about all right. Trey Turner and even above him, Freddie Freeman, two of the uh, you know the best players in baseball. Freddie Freeman was a top five fantasy finisher this past year. Um, you know, was only averaging one point five seven uh, total bases per hit. So just uh, you know one and a half bases per hit, which is uh, as a, not super good, but. The thing is, and why they're so successful, is just the overall volume. Freddie Freeman and Trey Turner are people that are always healthy, okay, knock on wood, always healthy, always available, and always hitting at a high average, and <clears throat> while still contributing in those other categories, being stolen bases, and making themselves more independent in other ways besides just smashing the ball from place to place and uh, hoping that people are on base, um, whatever. So Trey Turner and Freddie Freeman, similar situation, but they both succeed because they play every single day at the top of the lineup, good team. But well, this will uh, kind of um, you know, put into better picture uh, the full story, which is like a total basis plus stolen basis. So we're including now the uh, total basis. How efficient is someone, <clears throat> how effective is someone as a batter alone? And then also including their opportunities to uh, you know, steal bases. How many bases individually are they earning uh, as a player across the entire season? And uh, Trey Turner, that's what he shows his value. Um, you can't be afraid of taking Trey Turner. Trey Turner will never win you an MVP, but Trey Turner, as he shows this past year, will <clears throat> essentially individually produce the second most. Uh, there's only one person that beat him tied with Paul Goldschmidt being Aaron judge and uh there's no, there's not one person. There's only one person that beat him uh, in regards to uh, an individual production, hitting and taking uh, the base pass as a runner. So you can't be afraid of taking Trey Turner with your second pick, especially with how uh, you know short stops looking th this year and sort of every year. It's just it's it's one of the most bona fide guarantees. Uh, but also you can see players like you know Fernando Tatis at the same position uh, skyrocket and pass Trey Turner from uh, an overall points by a country mile because the uh, ce the ceiling is that much higher than Trey Turner. But again, Trey Turner healthy, available, whatever. Total bases per uh, uh, plus stolen bases. Jordan Alvarez, even with all those less uh, those little amount of bats. He's so strong and he's hitting the ball so far every time he gets up, making the most of his, of his bats. He's still a top 25 player in that category. So um, let's reset and kind of look at a different situation. Um, let's skip down to uh, Randy Rose Arena and Anthony Centendar. And this is a situation where, um, you know, looking at sort of like two players that had the exact same production in almost every category, they scored the exact same amount of fantasy points, uh, but they also had the same amount of individual production from a total base perspective. The only difference was is Anthony Santadar sort of um, represents the brute power uh, side of baseball. And then also, uh, it, um, and then Randy or Rosarina represents more of the hybrid, uh, strong and fast, versatile player and though they scored the same amount of points this time uh considering you know the uh, the bonus the rbis and the runs that they can't account for how can we determine as individuals um you know which one is going to be more sustainably successful in the future uh given <clears throat> their play style so if we look across there at every single category they're pretty much on par at all the way across and you can look at it on your own if we go across the two home runs. Uh, Anthony Santander has had 13 more home runs uh, than Randy Rose Arena, and that's a significant amount. 33 home runs is a really, really good number. And it, honestly, 33 home runs with only 89 RBIs to account for that is just really, really bad luck. Baltimore's offense is Baltimore's offense. Um, obviously, I think we'll be improving with a couple more pieces getting older and coming into uh, their space more as full time players. But <clears throat> moving past that, you know, 13 more home runs and 33 overall and only 89 RBIs in like, you know, that four or five spot. It's kind of disappointing and I think a little unlucky, but if we go over to as well, more of an independent stat, Randy is getting 13 less home runs, but he's stealing 32 more bases than Anthony Santanar. So like, how, how does that play into things? You know, they have, uh, Randy has obviously um, a little better uh, of a, uh, a batting average because he has, you know, um, that many more hits, but at the end of the day, the total base number is tied at 261. If we look at that, it's it's tied. <clears throat> we sort. 
261, it puts them right at uh, thir- you know, 31st and 32nd ranked uh, you know, uh, total bases. So individually, as just batters in the box, uh, there were only 30 players that beat both Randy and Anthony Santanar um, as hitters. But if we, again, if we talk about our ability to be more individual uh, and um, more individually valuable per at bat, also adding on the fact of like, if you're faster, a being able to stretch out more extra base hits than the average bear, if you're on first base, you got a hit by pitch or you walked or you singled, uh, your ability to steal yourself into second base makes you more of an independent player because again, you're able to put yourself in a scoring position for your teammates to hit you and earn that bonus, bonus category point. Uh, that is very meaningful, but we can't can't forecast for we've already heard talked about this but go to just determine against these had these guys had the same exact production uh and they were you know individually as just hitters they were 30th and 31st um overall if we go to total base per hit that's kind of where we see a little bit of the drop off um so if we go down anthony is going to be all right 29th he's in the top 30 with production per at bat um which is again a good number to keep in mind like this, is, this guy had career numbers last year but like looking to see where Randy dropped to similar situation to Trey Turner all the way down to 85th overall um, as the, you know, uh, the most productive player, 30, 85th most productive player per at bat only at only 1.69 compared to 1.89 total bases. And that's meaningful, but looking at it from a full, full story, full perspective, because Randy is able to steal that many more, 32 more bases than Anthony. This is really like what paints the story. They scored the exact same number of points, fantasy points, because Randy Arozarena essentially got stuck on base 32 times, 32 more times uh, than Anthony Santander did. And Anthony Santander has a pre-draft ranking of 67. Randy Rosarina has a pre-draft ranking of 96. These players scored the exact same amount of points last season, but Randy took on his own 32 more bases than Anthony did. Therefore, we have uncovered that Anthony, not nah, Randy Rose. I've done this twice now. We've uncovered that Randy Rose Arena is the more sustainable, more productive pick, even being 30 picks back in the draft, because we've determined that he was maybe a little uh, more unlucky than the other player. Obviously, we talked about uh, Anthony Santanar only having 89 uh, RBIs, the same number as Randy, with 13 more home runs. That's bad luck. <clears throat> but overall, Randy was able to create 32 more bases on his own compared to Anthony, and he got stranded that much, that many more times throughout the season. So uh, those opportunities do add up. I think that, uh, we, again, this upcoming season, Randy will outperform Anthony Santanar because he's independently uh, and volume-wise putting himself into a position to succeed and earn those bonus points on his own uh, more frequently, meaning setting himself up for success more frequently, which is what we're all trying to do in life all the time. So, um, and also, like, if I am going to sort and go down, uh, Randy's speed score compared to Anthony's for a better perspective is an 86 versus a 30. Um, so that really speaks to, you know, Randy's plenty fast and Tampa Bay didn't score a ton of runs last year. He kind of was their power uh, and their speed. So he was kind of relied upon to steal a lot of bases. And it's got to be kind of that same uh, story this year with him being, you know, probably the, main, the number one home run threat still in that lineup coming up this year. So, or power threat, speed threat. Randy's going to be stealing bases. Anthony will not. I, I expect Randy to outperform even being three points behind. And for our final player comparison, I am going to use Austin Riley and Francisco Lindor. And this is basically to kind of, uh, we're going to highlight these statistical outliers for both a player that is overrated and a player that is underrated. Not that Francisco Lindor is crazy overrated. He's just overrated in comparison to Austin Riley, who is the most underrated player in all fantasy baseball coming in to this year. So if we just highlight Austin Riley, I'm just going to drag him up to be here uh, next to Francisco Lindor, just to make things easier on the eyes. Um, Overall production, uh, we have essentially two top 20 players uh, coming into this year's draft. One is ranked at 32, being Lindor, and uh, Austin Riley ranked at 47, at least according to ESPN. If we focus on the dependent stats, besides stolen bases, Francisco Lindor is uh, winning every dependent stat, um, and none of the independent stats except, again, stolen bases. But if we focus on like the speed aspect, <clears throat> we can see that, and I don't know why this didn't, didn't transfer, but if we can see that Austin Riley actually has a, a higher speed score than Francisco Lindor. Um, so the stolen bases aren't necessarily telling the story. It's more that Francisco Lindor gets on base. Uh, Pete Alonso, or depending on how they kind of shift their lineup around, is or is not behind him. And then there's really no power behind Pete Alonso. So he's kind of having to uh, steal 
steal himself into bases uh, instead of just the jam-packed one through nine power lineup that is the Atlanta Braves. Austin Riley's never really expected to steal bases and uh, not as many opportunities to take the base. So like it kind of speaks for itself in the amount of uh, you know d- doubles and uh, home runs that are hit. He's able. He's he's plenty fast enough. So I just want you to focus on kind of like Francisco Lindor being more uh, more of a lucky player. So Francisco Lindor, 12 less home runs and managed to score 14 more RBIs on the entire season and also outpaced Austin Riley by, uh, you know, eight runs on the entire season. The uh, batting average is similar. The uh, the on-base percentage is similar. Obviously, slugging is a lot higher for Austin Riley, but this is kind of where we get into like sometimes it's just a situation where sometimes it's better to be lucky than it is good uh, kind of thing. But this is really, again, speaking to the like the volume um you know, aspect of this, that this has. So if we look at total bases, even though Austin Riley scored 14 less points on the entire season uh, than Francisco Lindor, he <clears throat> outproduced Francisco Lindor by uh, approximately 40, ba- uh, for 40 total bases. And he was outproduced total bases wise by only one person in all of baseball being Aaron Judge. So he was number one in the NL, most productive as a hitter, as a standalone hitter, total bases, Oh, man, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm starting to sweater. Uh, Austin Riley is the second most productive player individually as it relates to total basis. If we look at Francisco Lindor, Francisco Lindor is down to okay, like the 21st position, still like credible, still good. Uh, but like if you're looking to draft someone for, for your second or third pick, you would want someone to be individually more productive than, uh, you know, in the 20s per se, that early in the draft. That's kind of what I'm trying to hit on. If we go to total bases per hit per se, um, Austin Riley is down to a uh, top 20 player. He, he has a ton of volume over 600 at bats, but he's still averaging 1.93, you know, total bases per hit while carrying the 273 really strong average. And you can see how many of these people ahead of him, um, you know, don't have that 240 or above average uh, that kind of like knocks them out um, of contention and didn't really have enough at bats to really be considered a full-time player. So, you know, Austin Riley, essentially our top five, 15 guy as it comes to quality as well. Whereas if we scroll down, you get all the way down from the skill indoor, who is essentially ranked 100th out of, you know, in the entire category across all players in baseball, 100th from a quality perspective. He's really getting the most out of his volume, uh, but he's also getting hit in and knocking in guys that just happen to be there. That's just the, how the stats work out. If we go to total bases plus stolen bases, how, indiv- how individually productive is this person, um, you know, uh, alone? What are they doing? And it's so again, number five overall, Austin Riley at the 47 uh, average or uh, the pre-ranked draft spot is the best value in baseball. Whereas you know, Francisco down, Lindor down to a uh, batter overall, um, you know, the 20th spot is just not, it's, it, it's, it just kind of shows that even though you can be um, essentially uh, was it 20 or 40, like uh, 40 total bases ahead of someone who beat you in a lot of categories. Um, it just kind of comes down to luck sometimes of being able to, uh, it, of getting hit in or hitting an RBI to score those bonus hits. So again, that's the end of the show. I hope that you found that helpful. Um, again, I want to talk about and reiterate that the link to my draft tool that's for free, I provide for you guys. I just need to add in all the notes, but uh, a lot of the highlighting is done. And then, um, you know, the, the batter evaluation and the starting pitcher evaluation, which I'll do next, um, are available to you guys for free to, uh, you know, kind of sort of prepare uh, on your own. So again, thank you so much for your time and uh, I look forward to talking to you next time.